I first thank the organizers for inviting me this excellent workshop. Um, and it is my great pleasure to sharing our recent progress in the, this area with you guys by this workshop. I prepared today's talk with the title on the spectrum of pure high speed gravity. And today's work is based on the, my recent two papers the first one with Luis Fernando Alde at Oxford, and second paper with Fernando Alde, Nathan Benjamin at Princeton, and Carmen George Diaz at Oxford. In this talk, I want to mainly focus on the pure quantum gravity defined on ADS3. This system is classically described by this Einstein Hilbert action, and imperturbatively, this Einstein Hilbert action is known to be equivalent to a Chern Simon theory. So, the gravitons in this system is not the propagating degrees of freedom. In other words, there is no gravitational wave. So, the, at first glance, it looks like that this theory is very boring theory because they just only include the trivial degrees like a graviton and their multiparticle states. However, it turns out that the theory is more than trivial because of uh, some special solution found by these gentlemen. Actually, this solution can be considered as a black hole solution as they have some finite size horizon and their mass and spins are also well defined. And furthermore, their Bekenstein Hawking entropy is also well defined. For this reason, we call this solution as BTG black hole. Another interesting and important aspect of the three-dimensional gravity is actually its asymptotic symmetry. Uh, by, work, the, the, by the work by uh, Brown and Hanno, it turns out that the asymptotic, gra asymptotic symmetry of the standard gravity on ADS3 is give up, given by two copies of the Virasoro algebra. And in this setup, we'll set the left central charge and the right central charges are same, uh, just because not to consider about the gravitational anomaly. Then, from this discovery, we can say that uh, to investigate the three-dimensional gravity, um, actually we can utilize some, some boundary field theory, which is governed by the Virasoro algebra. Actually, the 2D CST is a very strong candidate for the boundary th theory. So here, we wanted to utilize the two-dimensional conformal field theory, and especially the modular invariance of the torus partition function to investigate the spectrum of three-dimensional gravity. Let me make some comments on the spectrum of the pure three-dimensional gravity. I just borrowed this figure from the paper by Maloney and Keller. We can classify the spectrum by two classes. The first class is I call by uncensored states. This basically covers the heavy operators in theory. The second class we can consider is actually these censored states and they basically covers the light spectrum of a given theory. So, Following our previous uh, discussion, we now know that the pure 3D gravity actually Im can involve two kinds of ingredients. The first ingredient is actually this perturbative excitations. They involve graviton and their multiparticle states. And all the censored states uh, living in this area actually in included in this perturbative excitations. Because uh, these perturbative excitations are contributed by graviton and, and their multiparticle states, their partition function actually takes the form of this equation, this function. Actually, that's nothing but just a beta sort of vacuum character. It is actually not invariant under the modular uh, transformation. Therefore, itself cannot be considered as a full partition function. This means to construct a full modular invariant partition function, in addition to the, this perturbative excitation, 
we needed to add additional primary operators. And we would like to interpret these external primary operators as a second ingredient of this pure quantum gravity, namely the black holes. So these black holes are basically the uncensored states, and they are in this talk, I want to consider them as a SL2, Z images of perturbative excitations. At this point, I want to raise one question. Suppose I completely know the spectrum of this sensored area. Then my question is, using the, this modular invariance, can we completely determine the states of the uncensored region or not? That's actually my question. And in case of the holomorphic form, the answer is yes. And it is already well studied by this kind of papers. Here I prepared one explicit example for the illustration. Suppose I have some holomorphic uh, modular form whose polar term is simply given by 1 over Q. Then if I require the whole holomorphic modular form is invariant under the modular transformation, it actually fixes all the higher terms uh, appeared in this holomorphic modular form. There is an ambiguity. Actually, by this method, we are not able to fix the constant, but except this constant, every terms are actually completely fixed by the modular invariance. It is very natural to ask what happens for the non-holomorphic modular form. In this case, our starting point is actually the partition function of the perturbative excitations, like this uh, Virasoro vacuum character. And we wanted to require the full partition function should be invariant under the modular transformation. In this case, unfortunately, the modular constraint does not completely and uniquely fix the spectrum of the uncensored lesion. This means there are some ambiguities that exist, and I will discuss uh, this ambiguity in my later slide again. So let me tell you the goal of this project or the goal of the spectroscopy. We want to search for the partition function that satisfies positivity discreteness, integrality, and modular invariance. So here I prepared some diagram which depict our basic strategy of this work. Our start point is actually this perturbative excitation. As I said before, this partition function is contributed by graviton and their multiparticle states. Then, we're looking for the full modular invariant partition function whose sensor operator is governed by this uh, partition function, the perturbative partition function. As I illustrated in the previous slide, there could be some ambiguities of constructing modular invariant partition function. The most famous construction has been suggested by Maloney and Witten, or Maloney and Keller. They utilized the Poincaré series to construct the full modular invariant partition function. And in this work, we suggest a different modular invariant partition function using the Rademacher expansion. And definitely, they share the same sensor spectrum with the Poincaré series, Poincaré, the, the partition function constructed by the Poincaré series. And after constructing some modular invariant partition function, we need to investigate the spectral density of individual states. And the spectral density should be satisfied these three conditions, positivity, discreteness, and integrality, because we are discussing about the quantum gravity. So if we are not able to find such modular invariant partition function, then maybe we can conclude there could be no consistent three-dimensional pure gravity on ADS space. So this is sort of basically our goal. So by analyzing the spectrum of the three-dimensional uh, gravity, we would like to check the well-definedness of the, uh, the three-dimensional gravity. So this is the main motivation of this work. Okay, 
Now let us discuss how we can construct the modular invariant partition function using the Poincaré series. So this will be just a short review of the work by Maloney Witten or Maloney and Keller. First, we need to define the path integral. Basically, the idea is that we sum over all three manifolds whose boundary manifold is given by torus. Then in the semi-classical limit, the, the partition function actually can be approximated by this expression. Uh, here, G star basically means the set of points that solving the equation motion for a given boundary. And this part uh, denotes the classical contribution. And we have some perturbative corrections uh, to the, this uh, classical, classical contribution. So as we wanted to explicitly compute this gravity partition function, the first thing to do is classify all the solutions to the equation motion with the torus boundary, uh, whose the, the boundary is given by torus. So we need to classify all the possible settles. Actually, that is done by the paper by Mello and Witten. It has been known that the three manifold actually takes the form of ADS3 over gamma, where gamma is some discrete subgroup of ADS3. Uh, I have uh, one question. Yes. So here you talk about the partition function and uh, of the, this metric, we did get metric. But uh, later you will go to the churn Simon. So no, no, sorry. No, no, sorry. In in this talk, I will not consider about churn Simon theory. I just uh, saying them because of I just uh, to emphasize the equivalence of these two classical corrections. But in this talk, I will not use the churn Simon theory. I see. Uh, so for higher spin, you still talk about uh, this metric like a formulation. Yeah. Later. So so we we will later. We will suggest to you uh, how to we can compute the one loop partition function using the heat kernel method. There we simply start from the uh, free field, uh, I mean the, 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 the action, Einstein Gilbert like action. Not, we are not using the Chan Simon theory there. Oh, okay. Is there another question? Okay, then let me proceed. So uh, here, once we declare, the boundary of three manifold is given by torus, then Maloney and Witten shown that there are only two possibilities for the dis discrete subgroup. The first class, we will call this by SOMAR ADS3. And in this case, the discrete subgroup is isomorphic to the Z. And in this case, we can label the three manifold by two integers, S and minus R. On the other hand, we can also have the second class, which I will call by the conical defect. In this case, the discrete subgroup is isomorphic to the Z times Zm. I will discuss more about this conical defect in the, my later slide, and let us first focus on the thermal ADS3 first. So among the many manifold M S comma minus R, the most simple manifold is actually M0 comma one. In this case, we can assign the Hamiltonian interpretation to compute the partition function. Actually, the partition function is now have two chemical potentials for the time translation and the spatial rotation. And Ian Ziombi Maloney's paper actually explicitly computed this partition function at one loop. Their result reveals that actually this partition function is given by this kind of a Pirasoro vacuum character. And this actually, this 0,1 basically count the graviton and their multiparticle state, which I introduced at the previous slide. So we would like to construct the modular invariant partition function that involves this uh, simple partition function, Z0,1. The idea is very simple because this general manifold M S comma minus R can be obtained from this M zero comma one by applying the modular transformation. The idea is simply add all possible modular images of this Z zero comma one. Then because we already included all the possible, uh, the group element of S zero comma Z, the full partition function is automatically uh, modular invariant. 
So the remaining thing is just to find the explicit form of these modular images that can be done by the Poincaré series. So let me uh, briefly introduce what is the Poincaré series. In case of the holomorphic modular form, uh, the basis are already well known. For instance, we can utilize the weight four and the weight six Eisenstein series as a basis of the holomorphic modular form. Unfortunately, for the non-holomorphic modular form, such a basis are not uh, fully known. Nonetheless, we can utilize some known non-holomorphic modular forms to express our partition function. So first non-trivial, uh, so first non-holomorphic modular form I want to introduce is this real Eisenstein series and its definition is given in here. And actually this real Eisenstein series is invariant under the modular transformation. Another object I want to introduce is this Poincaré series. To illustrate this Poincaré series, we start from some, um, some object, I will call this by seed, uh, assigned with there some energy log E and spin J, and just to simply add all possible modular images over this seed. Then, here I have some Fourier coefficient epsilon J comma M, Actually, the expression, explicit expression of this Fourier coefficient can be found from the Poisson resummation formula. So in summary, uh, by this Poisson resummation formula, we have explicit closed form expression for this uh, Fourier coefficient. Before moving to the next, let me add one comment. If I said large E and large J to zero, then actually this Poincaré series leads to the, to the uh, Eisenstein series with S equal one half. So in this sense, we can say that this Poincaré series is generalization of the real Eisenstein series. Now, let us express the gravity partition function by this Poincaré series. So this was uh, firstly suggested by Maloney, Witten, and Keller. Thus we call this partition function as MWK partition function. You see, actually, the, the term inside of this parenthesis is actually nothing but just a beta sort of vacuum character, the numerator of the beta sort of vacuum character. And we simply multiply this quantity to the both side. This is possible because uh, this object itself is a modular invariant. Then, if you return to our original definition of the Poincaré series, you can easily see that actually this gravity partition function if nothing but just a combination of four Poincaré series, like uh, presented here. Because we know the explicit form of the Poincaré series with the Poisson resummation formula, this means the structure of the modular invariant gravity partition function is completely known. Actually, that's the one of the, the, the main uh, computation um, done by this, uh, this, this, this gentleman. And we now have this partition function, then we can uh, investigate the spectral density of the individual state. For that purpose, I wanted to take a Fourier expansion of this uh, uh, partition function. Then the definition of spectral density is actually the coefficient which I wrote here, which I wrote by rho je. Note that the left-hand side is now completely known in terms of the Poincaré series. So to read this spectral density, what we need to do is simply applying some of the integral transformation like uh, inverse Laplace transformation, then it is straightforward to read this spectral density. Recently, there has been very interesting paper appears. The, the, the work by Benjamin, Ogri, Xiao, and Wang, actually they uh, revealed some problems on this MWK partition function. They considered some specific limit, sending small e to the small j. By the way, the definition of small e and small j is uh, presented here. And they also considered the largest limit. In this case, using from the Poincaré series expression, the spectral density actually have this structure. And the problem is actually they have the minus sign here. So this means we have some of the negative norm states. 
So in this sense, this MWK partition function is partially successful because if we return to our previous diagram, up to this stage, uh, we are completely successful, but their spectral density is failed to test with their positivity and discrete need test. So in this sense, the MWK partition function cannot be considered as a partition function of well-defined pure, uh, pure quantum gravity in ADS3. Sorry, but did you say the spectrum is also not discrete? Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, the spectrum is also not discrete because you know this spectral density is continuous function. If the spectrum is discrete, we expect the spectral density would be expressed as uh, some superposition of the uh, delta function, but it is not. Uh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, let me go to the next. But actually, in my previous slide, I tried to emphasize in case of the non holomorphic modular uh, form, uh, well, there could uh, be some. Just uh, one. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, it's the spectral, in, in the spectral density uh, where one is taking C goes to infinity limit uh, there, uh, as I understand. Yes. And uh, where uh, the discrete spectrum, in this limit, uh, discrete spectrum can be continuous. Uh, you are, yeah, yeah, right, right. So in largest limit, we can approximate the discrete spectrum as some the continuous spectrum. That's right. But in principle, they should be considered as some the superposition of the delta function. Although approximately they become continuous function. Um. I, I mean, I'm just saying in principle, because we are discussing about the quantum gravity, Although logic limit, the, the superposition of a delta function is approximated by some continuous function, but in principle, they should be discrete spectrum. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, so from the result of rho that you have shown on this slide, it's hard to say whether it's discrete or not. If it's just macroscopic leading with the expression. Uh, I agree with that, the yeah. The party formula looks like that, right? So. That doesn't say that the underlying CFT has a continuous spectrum. It's just a artifact of approximation. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So in this largest limit, actually with the, this expression, it, it is not very clear if this is really described the continuous spectrum or discrete spectrum. But uh, at here, let me just focus on the more on this negative norm state instead of the discreteness. Is that okay? So can I ask another question? Yep. So the, why we consider this limit? Oh, you mean this small, you're going to the small j limit? Right, yeah. Um, can I postpone the detailed explanation in my oh, later yeah. slide? Yeah, I prepared sure, yeah. about that, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so in previous slide, I tried to emphasize there could be some ambiguities in the non holomorphic modular form. So this means that maybe we can construct some different modular invariant partition function, uh, which shares the same sensor spectrum with the Poincare partition function. Then after we construct such a partition function, the, nat the natural question is, if that partition function also exhibits some problem with the negative norm states. So now I want to suggest a new way of constructing the modular invariant partition function. To this end, I want to reconsider everything in the 2D CFT side. Uh, Jin Mom, excuse me to interrupt, but okay. uh, if you consider the 3D gravity as a churn Simons theory, Yes. To correspond to some uh, non-compact uh, gauge group, right? Yes, right. Right, I said so, to comma C if I consider Euclidean. Yeah. Exactly. So from the 2D CFT perspective, shouldn't you naively expect a continuous uh, continuum in the spectrum? It's a very naive question. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know very well about the topic. But, uh, yeah.
I'm thinking of Vesumino written models with non compact uh, Lie group. Um, no, um, it's just a different story, but there has been some. No. No, no, no. I can say in this way. So I understand your, your question, but the, the, what I want to do is following. So we are considering the 3D gravity, and yes. we want to analyze that by the 2D CFT on the boundary. Okay. And the system is actually, um, so here the, the, the 2D CFT, our, our interest basically the compact CFT. Okay. Yeah, so I, so I don't want to um, discuss about this turn time of theory. And mm -hmm. in, as far as we are considering this setup, actually we do not worry about that, that, that issues. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so here, I wanted to consider the two-dimensional conformal field theory on the torus. And in this case, the torus partition function is defined by following. And again, we introduced two chemical potentials for the uh, time translation and uh, the spatial rotation. And because we are considering the 2D CFT on the torus, we require the partition function should be invariant under the modular transformation and that they can be expressed by this equation. And let me shortly comment about the general structure of the torus partition function. Here we will assume uh, there, there is no extended chiral algebra and the central charge is larger than one. In this case, generally the torus partition function have a form of this equation, where the chi zero means the Virasor vacuum character and chi h means the uh, non-degenerate vacuum character, uh, non-degenerate Virasoro character with conformal rate H. And the ter their characters explicitly take this form. And here, this uh, DHH bar means the degeneracy. It should be positive integer. So this is our starting point. And actually combining with this modular invariance condition and the general structure of this uh, uh, partition function, we can basically construct a cornerstone equation for this uh, project. I will call this equation by the bootstrap equation. And my, one of my final goal is to investigate the heavy spectrum and their degeneracies by investigating this uh, constraint equation. So to read this uh, spectral density or this uh, degeneracy, I wanted to apply the Lademacher process to here. So before uh, applying the Lademacher process to the non-holomorphic uh, modular form, as an one more exercise, I want to explain how we can apply the Lademacher expansion to the holomorphic case. So this section would be some brief introduction about the Lademacher expansion. So is there any question so far? Okay, then let me go. I want to consider the holomorphic modular form whose Q expansion is given by this expression. Here, I will assume there are just a finite number of polar terms. If there are no polar terms, then uh, the Lademacher process just giving us the C numbers. The goal over here is to find this fully equipped AN using the modular property of this holomorphic modular form. Here, I will assume this coefficient function exhibit the power law behavior when I taking small beta limit. Then we simply insert this Q expansion to here. This leads to a constraint equation of this form. And if I setting um, small beta limit, then the right hand side, we only have a finite many terms, which is inherited from this uh, finitely many polar terms. And all the higher terms actually suppressed when I taking beta to zero limit. Then now we can lead this Fourier equation just to applying the Fourier standard Fourier analysis. So the thing we needed to do is evaluate some contour integral to the right hand side. And another thing we need to do is find appropriate contour deformation, which enable us to evaluate this contour integral. 
But here's one problem exists. As I send in beta to zero, this right-hand side actually shows the problem of the essential singularity. That's because we are have the term-like exponential one over beta. And if we play with the tau variable, then the essential singularity is exist at the point at tau equal r over s, where r and s are co-prime integers. So if we take some suitable control deformation, then we needed to choose some control deformation which avoids this essential singularity appear at the real tau plane. So let me explain more detail about that. So this is the basically the idea by Lademacher. He just tried to contour the deformation by following way. Our original contour is a straight line from tau equal i to i plus one. So this is our original contour. And we would like to contour uh, this straight line to these lead curves depicted in this figure. Actually, this lead curves follows the uh, arc of these individual circles. And I will call these individual circles by fold circles. A nice thing about this fold circle is that they actually tangent to the real line of this tau plane. And their meeting point to the real line actually takes the form of R over S where R and S are co-prime. And actually that point is exactly agree with the location of the essential singularity of this right hand side. And if I increase a number of the these fold circles, then you will see this lead covers actually covers the circumference of individual fold circles, but they will never touch this meeting point. So that means if we choose this lead cover as a deformed contour, we are free from the essential singularity. That's the important and basic idea of this Lademacher contour. And actually we can map uh, individual fold circles to the, this kind of a circle contour. Then the remaining thing is simply evaluate this contour integral on this type of the circle contour. That's basically how this Lademacher process uh, compute the Fourier coefficient. After some computation, here is the final result. Lademacher discovered the Fourier coefficient actually can be expressed by this infinite sum. Here this I denote the, uh, the modified Bessel function of the first kind. Because this Fourier coefficient is actually the, the infinite sum, we need to be very careful about its convergence. It has been known that if we are considering the modular form of a weight larger than two, then this is safely converges to the some suitable modular form. On the other hand, if the, module, the weight of the modular form is smaller than two, then one should be very careful. Sometimes it is known that this kind of infinite sum converges to the very weird thing like a bulk modular form. Let me give you explicit uh, the example. I wanted to apply this Lademacher process to the partition. The definition of the partition is simply inverse of the Dedekind theta function. And by expanding it Q parameter, its first few Fourier coefficients are given by these lead numbers. So my goal is to find some uh, analytic expression which is giving us these lead numbers. We can apply the Lademacher process I sketched before and with, combined with the, the modular property of this Dedekind theta function, we finally can find the Fourier coefficient PRN in terms of this infinite series. This is definitely converges and by numerically, one can check that actually this expression giving us this lead number. In this sense, this Lademacher process completely works for the partition. And it, uh, this is another kind of the modular form. So now I wanted to apply the Lademacher process to the non-holomorphic case. Uh, that's uh, basically our original motivation. But before going them, please uh, tell me if you have any question. Okay, if not, let me go to the next slide. 
I wanted to now apply the Laden marker process to the non holomorphic modular form. Then my starting point is actually this uh, modular bootstrap equation. So we just started from this constraint equation, then take a, a small beta limit while beta bar fixed. Then finally, we have this, we arrive to the, this kind of a constraint. And our goal is to find the analytic expression of this Fourier coefficient AJY applying the Lademacher process. After we find uh, the analytic expression of this object, we can simply apply the inverse Laplace transformation to read this spectral density. That's basically our strategy. So let me quickly uh, sketch how we can compute the Fourier coefficient by contour integral. Here we just, uh, for simplicity, let me first focus on the case of small r equal zero and s equal one. So this is consequence of the modular transformation sending tau to the minus one over tau. So what you need to do is just evaluate this contour integral over some appropriate uh, contour. And note that our original contour should be some straight line from x0 to x1. And uh, from this expression, you can easily see that actually there is essential singularity at these blue dot points. So we need to take some suitable contour deformation, which enable us to avoid these essential singularities. And we introduced the four circles to here and this, uh, after some contour, suitable contour deformation, we can check that the final, the contour deformation we arrive is actually this kind of the circle contour. So here the C0, comma one prime means this kind of a circle contour. We can evaluate this, uh, con this integral on this circle contour and the final result is actually given by this simple formula. So we suggest this uh, function as a Lademacher density for S equal one. For general S and the general R, it is very straightforward to compute this contour integral. And after some computation, we finally uh, find from the general expression of the spectral density. And I wanted to emphasize that actually this spectral density is definitely different from the one obtained from the Poincaré series. So in this sense, we can say that we derive some different partition function, different modular invariant partition function, though they share the same sensor spectrum. Now I want to discuss about the ambiguity. As I, I, as I said at the introduction, this partition function is not uniquely fixed by the modular invariant. This means starting from some Poincaré partition function or Lademacher partition function, we can add some ambiguities, where by this ambiguity we mean the Poincaré series with uncensored seed. So therefore this ambiguity itself is the modular invariant. And there are actually infinitely many new kind of the modular invariant partition function, which can be constructed in this way. In case of the holomorphic case, the ambiguity should be a constant, but we have this non-trivial quantity because we are discussing about the non-holomorphic modular form. Let me make a comment on this ambiguity, especially in the cardinal regime. If we consider the cardinal regime, uh, where the small e is extremely larger than small j, then from this expression, we can compute the asymptotic density, and the asymptotic density turns out to have this structure. Because our ambiguity corresponds to the Poincaré series with uncensored seed, so they should satisfy large E plus large J uh, strictly positive, then if we just insert this constraint here, the asymptotic density of this ambiguity is simply shows some oscillatory behavior. So they does not spoil the Cardi behavior. The most biggest Cardi, the, the contribution to the Cardi behavior actually came from the, this Poincaré or Lademacher partition function. So far, we constructed a new modular invariant partition function using the Lademacher process, and we should answer this question again. This new invariant partition function 
solve the problem of MWK partition function or not. Unfortunately, uh, it turns out that the answer is no. We find that both Poincare and Lade Marker density actually exhibit the negativity when we sending small e to the small j. And the point is that this negative density is a very serious problem and we are not able to cure this negativity with adding some proper ambiguities to partition function. So this means both Poincare and Lade Marker partition function cannot be considered as a, the, 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 the partition function over the pure three-dimensional gravity. I wanted to add more comment about these negative norm states, but before then, let me just move to the higher spin gravity. Uh, if, before going to the higher spin gravity, uh, please tell me if you have any questions to hear. Yes. So, uh, can you, maybe you already mentioned, but can you uh, please explain how, how uh, exactly is this constraint that you consider like pure gravity, like I mean, maybe high spin gravity? How is it encoded, like I mean, in this analysis precisely? So sorry, I, I missed your last sentence. Can, can you just like uh, uh, like clarify a bit, like how uh, the condition that you consider only pure gravity, like a pure maybe higher spin gravity? How is yeah, it encoded? Like I think that it clarified by uh, this. Uh, the, 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 here. So our start point is actually the, the, the perturbative excitation, and we require our the modular invariant partition function involves the light, the light spectrum of the partition function is only consists of these perturbative excitations. That's the reason why we are saying about the pure gravity. I see, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, can I, can I uh, ask more? Slightly confusing because for, for pure gravity, the only excited states that are coming from BTZ black holes. So in that sense, you already you kind of have the spectrum. So I'm confused how you how you actually start. Sorry, as far as I understand, all as you said, all the excitations are BTZ black hole, but they can be realized by the, the modular images of the perturbative excitations. Perturbative excitation. I, I mean, I mean, the perturbative excitation means the graviton and their multiparticle states. I I'm mean, saying about th this one. So here, so these are correspond to the perturbative excitation, and their modular images are correspond to their BTG black holes, which is considered as excitation states. Uh, uh, so, so the perturbative in perturbative where I mean in the gravity side, there's no graviton in AdS three. Um, no, no, I, I'm just saying the trivial degrees. I mean, although graviton in 3D is no propagating degrees, we can consider some tower of the multiparticle states from the graviton in 3D gravity, pure 3D gravity. Um, so, so, so the related question is that where, where are these uh, ambiguities coming from? Do you have a gravity picture or you just don't know so that you are trying uh, no, this, this ambiguity is actually um, ambiguity about the heavy spectrum. So this ambiguity, I'm not saying about this light spectrum. So the both Lademacher and the Poincare partition function shares the same light spectrum, but this ambiguity is actually came from the, some excitation states. So I mean, um, although they share the same light spectrum, the, their excitation spectrum could be different. That's what I wanted to say. So yeah, and also I, uh, I'm slightly confused about this. This, this morning when uh, Eric Permitter explained his work, like he said, like roughly, uh, like uh, the, the 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 spectrum of the low line spectrum can be used to determine the high energy spectrum even for the irrational CFTs uh, under some assumptions, which which I don't really remember. Can do you actually? Uh, can you maybe clarify that or? Um, well, our, our answer is that here, both Poincare, Poincare construction and the Lademacher construction, actually they utilized the light spectrum to express the, the heavy spectrum. But what I wanted to say is that the way of fixing the heavy excitation states is not the unique. There could be some different way of uh, determining the 
spectrum in their uncensored ledger. Yeah, my understanding is that in, uh, in, in, the, in this morning session, like he, Eric claimed that um, if you impose uh, discreteness and integrality mm -hmm. that more or less fix the high energy spectrum from the low energy. So I needed to carefully read about this, his paper, but I, I remember he also considered about some like a cospital form. Mm -hmm. I believe that, that, that cospital form is basically correspond to the ambiguity of our terminology. So okay. what I wanted to say is that the light spectrum, if I use the modular invariance, it does not completely and uniquely fix the heavy spectrums. But, but, but can you say that this uh, ambiguity is under control uh, or the, in the sense um, that it's certain? Um, no, actually they are, so, so, so what, yeah, no, they are not, not under control. I, I, I don't know any sharp argument about this ambiguity, but what we did is just to simply applying the Lademacher expansion, find some, explicit form of the possible different modular invariant partition function. But if you are asking about if what is the, the general structure of this ambiguity, I don't have any clear the, 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 the answer for that question. Okay, thank you. So, hi, Jin Bong. So, can I ask you another question? Yes, please. Yeah, so, sorry, I don't know too much about this, the current literature, but I remember in the old paper by Witten, he assumed that there's a holomorphic characterization of the partition function. So, so but which, here, which, 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 uh, so, holomorphic factorization of the position. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but here, so it, it, you mean that that is not uh, correct or in general, we, sh we shouldn't have any. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Actually, I did not explain it that, but um, note that here we impose only real setters. So such holomorphic factorization is, can be realized when you consider complex setters. Uh, and that, 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 that's actually out of this, uh, our work. So in this project, we impose only the real setters. That's okay. the reason why we are not able to see this holomorphic factorization. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, when you apply the local marker uh, expansion, uh, do you apply that on the uh, partition function for primary operator or, or just the full partition function? Sorry, can, can you can you can you tell me again? Uh, to talk? Yeah, sorry. So, uh, did you did you apply the expansion on the on the partition function for only the primary, or just apply to the full partition function? Oh. So in this case, yeah. The point is that we start from the light spectrum, and we express all the heavy operators in terms of the light spectrum. I think my, my question is that, um, so could you go to uh, the, the, yeah, yes, please. The, the next slide, so maybe the, the, the next one. Uh, so, sorry, the, the, Here? The, no, no, the, the, the later slides. Later. Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, okay, I, <laughs> I do not quite know. Which, so my, my, my question is that if you, if you multiply the, the bootstrap equation by the eta function square, then yeah. um, be, I mean, be, because eta function is, is uh, automatically marginal invariant. So yes. did you apply the 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 Radamaka, uh, the, the Radamaka expansion on the, the one the bootstrap equation after you multiply the eta function square or before? Oh, and and do you oh. get different answer? Sorry, let, let me see. Yeah, yeah, here, here we multiply this eta function to the trap equation. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, how many times do I have now? 10 minutes, right? Yeah, 10 minutes if you count it is one hour, but you can go slightly beyond that because we have extra 30 minutes. So don't <laughs> okay. be too stressed. Yeah. 
So, okay, now let me uh, focus on the, our attention to the higher spin gravity. And I wanted to ask some different question. Is there a consistent pure quantum higher spin gravity or not? So to answer this question, we simply repeat our previous analysis. We wanted to construct a modular invariant partition function, then investigate its spectral density. So three-dimensional higher spin theory is actually some special in that there exists a consistent theory where the graviton couples to a finite tower of higher spin particles. Furthermore, it has been known that the asymptotic symmetry of the higher spin theory is given by WN algebra. So this means to investigate the three-dimensional higher spin gravity, we needed to investigate the 2D CFT with the WN symmetry. So everything, the many aspects of this higher spin theory is very compatible to the, our previous examples. So the classical action also can be ex, uh, expressed by the Chern Simon theory. So the light degrees does not have any degrees of freedom. And those light spectrums are organized into the partition function is expressed in terms of the WN vacuum character. And we can apply the Lade macro process or uh, Poincare series to construct a modular invariant partition function. If we construct such a partition function, then we ask if the spectral density co is consistent with the discreteness, positivity, and integrality or not. So we repeat the spectrum analysis with the Poincare series and the Lademacher expansion in the irrational regime where central charge is larger than m minus one. So here is the brief structure of the- Excuse uh, me, sorry. Yeah. So for the pure non-higher spin gravity, without resolving this negativity question, I mean, what do you want to learn by extending it to WN higher spin theory? Just yeah. get the same yeah. negativity conclusion or what? So after, after discussing about it, this WN part, I will try to suggest a scenario of curing this negativity by adding some additional massive states. Oh, for, for, for both higher spin and pure. Yeah, yeah, gravity. exactly, oh, exactly. Okay, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thanks for the question. And here I prepared some general structure of the partition function of WN CFT. Again, I will assume there is no extended chiral algebra. Then the partition function can be expressed by in terms of the vacuum character of WN algebra and the non degenerate WN algebra. Let me make some comments about these characters. In principle, if we consider a, the characters of the WN algebra, we should assign some additional fugacities uh, regarding these higher spin currents. But for simplicity here, we would like to turn off every fugacities uh, associated with the higher spin currents. So we will pretend as the partition function is described by as a two variable function by Q and Q bar. In this circumstance, essentially, uh, these people showing uh, shown the unitary bound for the conformal weight. So the, if the to, to theory is consistent with the unitarity, the conformal weight should be larger than this value. So that's the one interesting observation. So let us now construct uh, the modular invariant partition function using the Poincaré series. We simply uh, start. Yes, I have please. a question. So in your analysis, uh, this large N, uh, the capital N is finite or supposed to be infinity? Oh, so here we focus on the finite N. Finite N. Yeah. Let's see. So you are talking, you are considering some finite number of uh, higher spin. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So is it that is, I mean, so if you have finite just pure, oh, I see. Yeah, so you don't consider the matter, just pure. Up to so here, that, we, yeah. we are only considered the pure, yeah. Okay. Yes, so now let me return to here. So we start from the, uh, this WN vacuum character and construct a mod full modular invariant partition function by simply adding all possible modular images and applying the Poisson resummation formula and after some computation, 
we discovered that the spectral density uh, from Poincare method actually uh, summarized by this past equation. So Jim Bob, can I ask one question? Yes, please. So now your partition function is not related to the partition function of BTG black holes, right? Um, sorry, what, what do you mean by the... So what is the connection between your partition function and the black hole, BTG? The, the connection is, uh, yeah. for instance, in this expression, yeah. we consider the, 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 the perturbative excitation partition function and its modular image. And that modular image is basically describe the excitation states, which can be considered as a black hole solution. With the higher spin. Yes, exactly, higher spin black hole. Oh, okay, thank you. Can I interrupt so, you once more with this subject? I mean, so, so in the higher spin theory, is the notion of event horizon invariant of the higher spin gaze symmetry? When you say it's a black hole, or, or, or do you just don't care? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, I mean, frank, maybe it's frankly speaking, yeah, here, frankly speaking, we are not seriously care about that. So we, this is kind of a conjecture. If there is some the higher spin black hole, then we would like to understand them with the, these extra primary operators. So the space-time interpretation of event wise and stuff, you, don't, you just don't care? Yes, at here. Yeah, thank you for the question. Right. Okay, thank you. So it also, does it, did, does it also include the, not only uh, BTG black hole or some higher spin charged black hole? Like Again, here, I'm just uh, ignoring all the chemical potentials of WN algebra. So here, it is very hard to see about these higher spin charges. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think to investigate about these higher spin charges, and then we needed to use the full character of uh, WN symmetry. But as far as I know, even for the W3, character is not completely known if I turn on the chemical potential with the W3 current. Yes, yeah, so let me continue. Um, we can apply the Lademacher expansion to obtain some uh, different type of the um, spectral density. So we just start from the dispartition function and require the modular invariance, then just taking the light cool limit, then evaluate some suitable contour integral. By doing this process, we finally arrive to the this expression. This is our suggestion to the uh, spectral density obtained from the Lademacher method. Let us compare the Poincare density and the Lademacher density. They are almost similar to each other, except this argument at the second Bessel function. In case of the Poincare density, they have n minus three over two, while in this Lademacher density, the sign has been flipped. So if we utilize the known identity of the Bessel function, we can see that for the old n case, both expressions are completely ugly. If we consider the even n case like W2, W4, W6, etc., then definitely the partition functions are different, and that difference can be understood by the ambiguity. Now repeat uh, this part. I want to discuss about this negativity um, arose from the spectral density. I think now the time to answer the previous question. Let me explain why the negativity appear in this specific limit. From the, uh, this expression, we can see that actually the dominant contribution of the spectral density comes when a small s equal to the large n. And the spectral density for large s larger than one is no longer positive. Therefore, in this specific limit, the negativity can arose. We can estimate the number of negative states by integrating this asymptotic density in this interval. And it turns out that the number of negative states is exponentially large. Therefore, it cannot be cured by adding ambiguities to the partition function. This is because these ambiguities cannot cover exponentially large amount of states. So in conclusion, it looks like that even at the highest spin side, both Lademacher and Poincaré series 
cannot provide us a consistent partition function. Now let me change a gear slightly, and I wanted to discuss how we can cure this negativity, adding some additional methods. For this purpose, I want to add some external operators of twist t, whose twist is actually given by this quantity. By next slide, I want to show you how these operators can cure the negativity of the, uh, this Lademacher and the Poincare partition function. By the so way, the this small yeah. So the additional matter that you put in will be in the polar part? Oh, so, 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 so this negative, negative, no, 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 no. In the, in the path integral respect, eventually it, that will correspond to the some adding ovipolar singularity. Uh, but, so but in, in, your previous, in, in your previous criterion, you're adding something to the uncensored part? Yeah, that's the, the, the that's like the, the perturbative right? spectrum. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yes. Okay, so here I prepared some simple exercise for the W2. Um, as discussed uh, the paper by Benjamin Collier and Maloney. So uh, we start from the Poincare or Lademacher density and taking this specific limit. And their spectral density is governed by this function. And definitely they exhibit some negativity due to this minus sign. And the idea is to add additional state with twist T1 and the T2 to cure this negativity. If we expand at large C limit, then the leading term actually given by this one, and this impose the average of twist we introduced should be bounded below by this quantity. Otherwise, this leading term becomes negative. That's the, that, that, that configuration cannot cure the negativity. In this paper, the three people suggested to interpret uh, this average as a conical defect. I want to add more comment on this conical defect, but going, before going to there, let me give you another exercise to clarify the point. Let us consider the W3CFT. Then we can compute the Lademacher and Poincare density. Uh, their asymptotic behaviors is governed by these two terms. Again, they exhibit some the negativity. You see there is a minus sign. And to cure this negativity, our strategy is to add three twist operators with T1, T2, T3. Then after expanding in large C limit, we, the leading term is given by this term. Thus, we can conclude that the average of this twist should be bounded below by this quantity to make the leading term positive. But here I want to emphasize one thing. If this average, is saturated, then we need to be very careful. That's because some additional negativity can arose from the subleading sub part. Nonetheless, we find that if we add two operators with twist this quantity and one operators with this quantity, then we are free from the negative norm states even in the subleading other. And very interestingly, the average of them is actually agree with this number, 2 over 9. And we observed that such patterns continues up to n equals 16. So we add this number of operators to cure the negativity in large C limit. Then from the leading other constraint, it turns out that the average of the twist we introduced should be bounded below by this this one, and especially we would like to understand this latter term. So now the, our question is following. How can you understand this average of a twist from the gravity side? To answer this question, we will borrow the idea uh, by these three persons, and we suggest to interpret this average of a twist as a conical defect. So before going to the next, uh, please tell me if you have any question. Otherwise, let me go, um, I think my time is over, but anyway. So let me show to leave you about this conical defect. The conical defect actually arose when I taking the discrete group gamma as G times GM. 
And actually, this this could go back to AGS3 with the fixed point. Therefore, this corresponds to the OB for the singularity. And actually, this ZM produces a deficit angle around this uh, spatial direction. And its deficit angle is given by uh, this quantity. And basically, it describes the massive particle whose mass is proportional to this deficit angle. I wanted to emphasize this point. In 2D CFT side, <coughs> sorry, actually, this conical defects correspond to the primary states with conformal weight h proportional to c over 24 times 1 minus 1 over m square. This can be seen from the one loop computation. So our next goal is to evaluate the one loop partition function on the conical defect background. And we will show that actually the final result takes the form of the non-degenerate WN character with proper um, conformal weight h. To this end, let me shortly leave you how can you apply the heat corner method to compute the one-loop partition function. So the basic idea is to express one-loop partition function in terms of the, this heat corner. The nice thing about this heat corner is that if we consider the integrated heat corner, then this can be expressed in terms of the SA2, C characters uh, chi alpha, and actually these characters are characterized by this alpha parameter. We needed to choose proper alpha to consider thermal ADS or conical defect. For instance, we can realize the thermal ADS3 partition function by choosing alpha to the exponential m pi i tau. Then after choosing this specific alpha, the remaining thing is to simply evaluate the integral that's straightforward. So after some computation, the thermal ADS3 partition function is given by this expression. So as expected, actually, this partition function takes the form of the uh, WN vacuum character. But here is one thing I wanted to emphasize. If we, after evaluating the one loop partition function, we observe that there could be some shift, one loop shift on the central charge. So here CG means the brown handle central charge, uh, which is proportional to the uh, one over Newton constant. Let, let us apply this heat corner method to the case of the conical defect. By choosing some appropriate alpha for this g times gm, after some long computation, we find that the partition function for individual spin s particle is given by this box equation. And actually the full partition function can be expressed by this, this equation. Here we assume, we first assume this length of the W algebra is smaller than large M. Then the, the product, in this product, the K can start from the one. Therefore, it exactly takes the form of the non-degenerated character of WN algebra. And its weight is given by this expression. And please note that here, the center charges we already reflected the one loop shift uh, presented it here. Let me add one comment regarding the unitary bound for the, this conical defect. If we take large n is larger than large m, then this product can be started from, for instance, k equal two. Therefore, the partition function takes the form of this quantity, and this cannot be decomposed by the unitary non-degenerate WN characters. In this sense, the unitary bound is violated so we can say that the unitary bound for the conical defect is given by this constraint. So the, the remaining part of this talk, we will, we will only uh, focus our attention to the, this special case. So this is the final comment. Let us return our previous result. We've shown that if we add some twist operators whose average is, is given by this quantity, then it cures the negativity at even the subleading other. And from the one loop gravity computation with conical defect, it turns out that the partition function can be understood as a non degenerate character with conformal weight this object. It seems that when the unitary bound is completely saturated, both subjects exactly agree to each other. For this reason, we would like to suggest the average of the twist 
can be understood from the conical defect. But still, frankly speaking, we do not fully understand why this average should be matched to the, this conical defect. We would like to understand this, and maybe we can uh, write some other papers in the future. Okay, here is some conclusion. Oh, maybe and, um, I, I, I missed your earlier explanation, but averaging means uh, averaging in which context? Can you repeat again? Sorry. Oh, average means simply, for instance, um, here we can add some, uh, some two operators with twist to this value and one operators with twist to this one, simply just taking average of these three operators. So, so include the country, include, include, include the monomial contributions to the partition function and divide by three? Yes. Uh, so, 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 you, so you expect that to be realizable by some gauging also maybe? Uh, that might be a good direction. So unfortunately, I do not have some clear idea why this average is connected to conical defect. You are manifestly violating integrality, that's right? To, 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 yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, buy, yeah, 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 that's a good point. Right, right, yeah, sure, of course, of course, yes. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, I think the time's up. So let me quickly uh, run over the, this conclusion and our loop. We shown that there is an ambiguity for the partition function and suggest an explicit way of constructing one some new modular invariant partition function using the Laden macro expansion. And it turns out that this Laden macro expansion, parti uh, the partition function obtained by this Laden macro expansion actually exhibits some of the negativity problem when you're taking small e to the small j limit. And unfortunately, it turns out that this cannot be cured by some adding additional ambiguity. So still, it is an unresolved un un question. Can you find a single dual CFT of the pure 3D quantum gravity or not? I really wanted to find some more conclusive answer about this question in the future. We also observed that the average scenario can be related to the conical defect, but we do not have very nice answer about why this average should be work. Recently, uh, there has been very interesting paper by Maxfield and Turiasi. They suggested to include a new class of topologies in the path integral to cure the negativity. And this, it looks like that this new uh, class of topologies are not uh, corresponding to the classical solutions we familiar. So I would like to understand about this point in, in the future or so. I wanted to conclude this talk by asking this question. What is the lightless bit of, for the path integral? We just followed from the idea of Maloney and Witten, and it turns out that uh, it does not provide us the light, uh, the correct, the partition function. It would be very interesting if we can find a right way of doing the path integral on the ADS3 gravity. Thank you, I will want to stop here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, we already had lots of questions, but still, I mean, more questions, please. Yeah, <clears throat> so, because this heavy state uh, would carry angular momentum, obviously the Euclidean configuration should be complex, not real, because whenever you have angular momentum, things become complex. And I don't know why uh, you don't think of a complex uh, geometry as a natural saddle point. Those are the dominating, not the real ones. Sorry, if I understand it correctly, if I even if I am considering some spinning spinning operators, the real saddle can be the real. Uh, that the saddle point can be real. You can you can because the, the the extension states are obtained from the uh, perturbative extension by applying the modular images. So because the, the, the perturbative extension itself is the real, applying the modular transformation, the extension states should be the real. So that's the, the reason why I'm saying the saddles should be real. So holomorphic case, holomorphic uh, gravity case uh, for Jacobi J function, you need a complex saddle. Right. And uh, if you make a square of that, obviously uh, that's the place that you know exact partition function and you know complex saddle up here. 
And I would prefer to understand that one first, then trying to apply to other cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be a good point. Yeah, so he, but I wanted to emphasize again, in, at least in this context, we just uh, constrain our, our interest to the real settles. But I, I would not say including the complex settles would be some insane argument. That could be lead us from the new, maybe consistent, the partition function. But yeah, currently, I don't, I don't, I do not have any specific answer about these complex mm -hmm. stories. Sorry, uh, can you remind me where the real or complex nature of your saddle affects your analysis? As far as I understand, you start from your perturbative part and use SQLT to generalize, SL2Z to generalize, generalize generate something, right? You don't really start from path integral, right? You start from uh, some input perturbative part and Poincaré series or Radama or whatever, you just generate some other terms. Where does the real or complex that will affect your analysis? Oh, the, the point is that if I return to here, yeah. the basic strategy of con constructing a modular invariant part partition function is just to add all the possible modular images. Mm -hmm. And we expect all the modular images are real, actually. Mm -hmm. That's the, the point where I reflected this real condition. So, so, so does that affect your Radha-Maha formula in, in, in some manner, assuming this reality of the saddle? Oh, that's I mean, a good point. So, yeah, so practically it, it, using your formula, I mean, I don't see anywhere that you use path integral. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a good point. All, yeah, in the Radha macro process, as far as I understand, we do not impose the real condition, but it turns out that the final consequence, the spectral density and the partition function, looks like individual, these are modular images, looks like the real. But, but then, then that's a result. I mean, what, what caused that? I mean, because you used the particular Radama prescription or what? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think I do not have a clear answer about that. So we just- It sounds that the reality of the saddle is a conclusion rather than assumption in your setup. I mean, right, right, right. Radama, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, How about right. the Poincaré series? Is that also looking like real saddles? Yes, I think so. Because the spec, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Poincaré density also exhibits in the real saddles. Okay, okay. Thank you. But uh, Jin Bum, the, the, the seed of your Poincaré method or Rademacher method is real, right? Maybe this is where, or not? Or is it too naive? So sorry, can you, can you, can you again? In, so, the, in the complex case, you would expect your partition function to globally factorize between holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, right? Like in the monster CFT, for instance. I think, so you're, you're asking why we are not captured the monster CFT by this computation or, sorry, I uh, missed your no, question. No, I, I don't see how you could capture it because you start from no, no. a C, which, yeah. In our, in our computation, we are not able to capture the monster CFT. Uh, but because the monster CFT, to, to, to have this holomorphic factorization, yes. the individual saddles should be the complex saddle. Indeed, yes. But this is my point. I mean, a, a priori, I don't see how you could capture complex saddles using this method. <coughs> Maybe this is why you only have real saddles, no? I think for the Poincaré sum, um, you can consider um, two different SO2Z, like X on tau and tau bar, and you sum over right. two different orbits, and that's how you get complex saddle. Exactly, yeah. I see, okay, yeah. Yeah, it makes mm -hmm. sense. Thanks, yeah, thanks for the answer, that's mm -hmm. right. It's a sort of diagonal SL2Z you're taking. Mm -hmm. Okay. More can questions? I ask a question? Yes, yes please. So, so again, related to this question about the path integral. So, uh, like you said in, in the conclusion, that I mean, you you want to kind of clarify like I mean, the right prescription for doing the path integral. But yes, right. I'm a little bit confused about what is the starting point. So, so like I guess you take like Einstein Hilbert, right? I mean, as the definition of the path integral, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I by that sentence, I mean, which saddles should we include in the path integral? Right, but the theory is like it's you are integrating over the, the I mean the way the, the action the classical action is, is the Einstein Hilbert, right? Right. So 
but this would not apply to the, uh, to the last part of, of your talk, right? And when discussing is the WN algebra, the higher spin, right? So in that case, the only way I would know how to do the path integral would be like I mean, to go to Chern Simons and then use some kind of higher spin Chern Simons, right? I mean, is that how you're thinking about it? So are you asking the way of computing the partition function by Chern Simon theory? So in, in the context of, of the uh, higher spin uh, discussion you had in the, in the latter part of your talk. Yes. So you were talking about WN algebra, right? Right. And so, so in that case, like, I mean, if I want to uh, approach this through the path integral, what would be the starting point? Um, in, the, in the CFT side, the starting point is actually the perturbative excitation of the higher spin theory. Right, I agree. But I'm asking not from the CFT side. I'm asking about the, the gravity side, the bulk side. So what would be the starting point for this discussion? Uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, we start, we start from the, some, 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 just the, the free actions of the higher spin gravity. Free action. Like a phi del phi, just a free action. And we I apply see. this heat corner method to, to compute to some, some small fluctuation around this uh, vacuum. I, I see, OK. So it's not a fully consistent, so it's just some kind of a perturbative approach, right? I mean, around like an EDS. Yes, yes. OK, thank you. OK, more questions? Please. Uh, have you considered uh, supersymmetry? Mm. That, 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 that's a good point. <laughs> Actually, in, in our paper, in the appendix, we also discussed about this uh, super WN algebra. Okay. But uh, in case of the super W3, for instance, if you consider n equal to super W3, actually the unitary representation is known to exist when central charge is less than 15. Oh, okay. Yeah, so although technically we can apply this uh, Lademacher and Poincaré whatsoever to the there, but I think it is hard to say about the, yeah. the supersymmetric W case because of this unitary bound condition. Okay. Good. Any more question to Jim Bon? Okay, we already had a lot of questions. So let's finish by th thanking the speaker again. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.